When Dylan grows up, he wants to be a professional soccer player and make it to the world stage. I'm often asked how I would describe Dylan and the first thing that springs to my mind is he's cheeky. Very cheeky, yeah, but fun cheeky. In your life of teaching, you meet some extraordinary characters and when Dylan was writing some goal setting, he just went straight in that one day I'll play on the world stage. As soon as you saw Dylan with a ball at his feet, you could see that there was something different about him. Everything about him was graceful. The best young player that I'd ever seen. The talent that he was and obviously the mentality that he had, I think that you would have put him down on the same page as the Viduka Kules and those type of players. Might be a chance for Tom Beatles. And he scored the winner. I was in tears. It wasn't a proud mum moment, it was a proud Dylan moment. He was being built to be, I suppose, the face of Australian football. I said to him at the end, I said, you know, Dylan, good luck. You know, you're going to go places. Some of the young players that come over, they seemed like they was under a lot of pressure and they froze up a little bit, but Dylan sort of took it in his stride and seemed like he was sort of comfortable in that environment. You just couldn't wipe the smile off his face. You know, his dream was coming true. We all know the deep sadness of how it turned out. Dylan O's Ditch has been at Kapanara for nine years. Tragedy strikes the very best of us. I didn't have too many times where I went, oh, he's not winning this fight. So I think we always kept that... Oh. <laughs> In life, health always comes first, but for me, and if you ask me, a lot of footballers, I would say football is just all they want to do, you know? We raised both Dylan and Taylor in Perth and really grateful for the outdoor lifestyle that Australia affords all of us. You know, it was very much, soccer was the main focus when Dylan, you know, learnt to walk. He just wanted to, he just had a ball at his feet. And then when Taylor was born, he finally had a partner in crime, so to speak. His brother was his best friend. Trace and myself, we, we gave the boys everything we could. They were fantastic kids. They were very active, always with ball sports. They would play football mainly through the main season, but then the off-season they would try their hand at tennis or at basketball or t-ball or cricket. Hey boys, say tennis. tennis! You'll see in some of the photographs where he's sleeping with his arm around a football. You watch sport on TV and run out the backyard and he'd watch sport for an hour and then run out the backyard and play for three hours. They grew up in an environment that was safe, had a lot of, you know, a lot of family, a lot of friends. So, um, yeah, they, they had a really happy, happy life. Dylan was in my very first class, which was a special experience because I was going in there with no expectations and then I had this glorious amazing group of kids and at the pinnacle of those children was Dylan Tombides who we called Didge because we had two Dylans in the class but the thing about Didge was his larger than life character and that was evident from the very first day that he walked into the classroom. Dylan has been awarded the bronze and silver medal. He's also the captain 
of the 2006 Kashmir State Soccer Team. When Dylan goes up towards the South, Samuel Soccer Club and made it to the world stage. Boom! He went through school and a lot of his awards were around welcoming the new kid that came to school and making him feel welcome and introducing him to all things that were going on in the school. So he was just really a thoughtful young boy and yeah, very proud to, to know that your child had those sort of characteristics about him. Dylan had laser focus. He had his eye on the prize and he knew what he wanted. In the classroom, it was pretty hard to get him to think about anything else. He tried, but you could see that he had nothing else on his mind but to get to that world stage. This is at our home field down here at um, Wembley Downs. And that's the referee for today, Jim Timbidis. That's Dylan's dad, he's a former A-grade player. He started at Wembley Downs, and I think that's all about fun, fun, fun. But uh, he had a couple of good coaches there, Hans Fish and David Helsinger. Oh, well played, boys. Well played. Lovely goal. I remember Dylan coming down to football training with in, to my son's team. This cheeky little blonde-haired boy um, came down, and uh, as soon as that he got a ball at his feet, you would start to take notice and say, oh, who is this young man? So he definitely made an impact on his first time that I saw him. Lovely, You could see that there was something different about him. He had good control and he was equally good with his right foot and his left foot. And uh, he just knew where he had to be on a soccer pitch at, you know, at any certain time. Was there any space to all of us? Leafly final goals, Mr. Dylan Tombini's. He kept playing here for about four years and then moved to other clubs and obviously developed as a player and um, under some influence of some very good coaching, achieved some tremendous goals. But then he made the move to Sterling and I coached him here so we were part of under the guidance of Mitch Doherty, who was linked to Man United. So the, once again, it's all a big step up, develop, development. Dylan flourished. He had a great little team, a great coach, who took him to a different level. And he spent a year and a half at Perth uh, before we made the move to Macau. Beginning 2006, when Dylan was 13, Taylor was 11. We moved up to Macau for my work. We thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to show both Dylan and Taylor uh, another part of the world. I can get I've got it was exciting for them. I'm really proud of the way they, they adjusted very quickly and were excited about the possibilities. There was a lot of activities around Macau where the kids could get involved and they weren't just playing against kids, they, they played cage football, five-a-side, um, against grown men, you know, some, some of them into their 50s and 60s. Literally after school, they would go and meet up with their mates and go play football. We'd spent sort of nearly 18 months in Macau and I was taking both him and Taylor over to Hong Kong every weekend to play in a better league. In 2007, I went back to Perth and caught up with uh, a West Ham scout, Mike Lee, who had always been keeping an eye on Dylan and his development. And he asked, you know, how Macau was, how it was all going, and I explained to him that we're looking to take Dylan over to Portugal for some trials because in Macau it's a very heavily populated Portuguese community and everyone, you know, has some connections. See, if you've got a mic, we can win. Mike said to me, oh, we're going, I'm going to be up in West Ham and in London in August. Um, we would, would you mind if Dylan came to us before he went to Portugal? So we made the move to go over to West Ham for trials and he spent a couple of weeks looking at under-18s and under Tony Carr's guidance. 
Within a very short period, Tony approached me again and said, look, we'll offer him Dylan a schoolboy contract. My first interactions with the Tom Beadies family first was with Jim Tom Beadies. I made contact with Jim. I'd heard about his son Dylan through a number of different sources in football. And I met him at a pub called the Moby Dick. You know, anyone that knows West Ham United will know the Moby Dick pub. We got on really well and he invited me around the house. I think the following Sunday, uh, where I met Dylan and Taylor. Taylor was a lot younger then. And from that moment, we instantly all clicked. Dylan is so hard to explain, but so easy as well. It was like he was made to be a footballer. You get 15 years old, he was like graceful. He flew across the grass, he was quick, strong, agile, and he got better quickly as well. I mean, he started off probably being one of the best at the club at 15 to being one of the best at the club at any age by 17. We started there in the under 16s for the season, and it was a fantastic team consisting of Rob Hall, Matthias Fanimo, Blair Turger, Don Voss, Dylan, and Tony Carr used to call them the Fabulous Five. We had a great team, a great age group, ours and the year above, because obviously we used to join together. We all loved each other, we stuck by each other, and um, I think playing together on a daily basis was definitely brought us closer together over the years. His transition from under 16s, under 18s to training with the first team was very, very quick. It was all in the one season. You were part of the first team squad for uh, the game against Burnley last night. You weren't on the bench, but how was it preparing with the, with the squad for that game? No, it was a great experience, you know, it's something different and something every young player looks forward to. Just to, just to be with a part of the first team around all those uh, big names, big players around this club was a really good experience for me, yeah. For us as a group, that was obviously um, big for us, you know, seeing one of our teammates being able to push through at such a young age and knock on the door of the first team. That was definitely an inspiration for us. Dylan was really playing well in the younger age groups and we were struggling. He wasn't playing well at the time. And he was playing so well that he couldn't be overlooked at times and he'd come and train with us, come, come on the pre-season tours. My name's Anton Weedy's nickname, Dill, position, striker. It's important that you keep your feet on the ground and keep working as hard as you've done. Obviously, you've got this far, but you know that you haven't you haven't achieved anything yet. I suppose in the game without no. being harsh. No, I've got, I've got a long way to go. Yeah, I know that. But uh, no, I'm just taking one step at a time and take my chances whenever I can. It's the final day of the Premier League season. I will be trying to play for now. I think the last game of the season for the first team. Avram Grant was, had been the coach and had said Dylan will play before the end of the year. He'll make his debut for the first team. Very unfortunately, Avram got the sack because West Ham at that stage were relegated. So it came to the last game of the season. The coach that came on didn't play Dylan. He had him on the bench. He didn't play him very unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Dylan didn't make his debut. They played somebody else. But you couldn't wipe the smile off Dylan's face, you know. He was just like, you know, we're sitting in the crowd, he's part of all the fuss, you know. He's, he leaves the ground and everyone wants to have his autograph. He was just loving life, he really was. He was just really, really excited. I know that he was grounded though. I knew that he would not walk in there with a big head or anything like that. I knew that he, he would show people what it was like to be a professional player because that's what had been instilled in him at, at West Ham. Behind the match officials and the flags of the game's governing body, the blue shirts of Australia. Just a wonderful occasion for these footballers. A chance to play in a World Cup. Promises to be a fantastic occasion as the teams line up. When he was out there, you know, he thrived. Manchester City flew to that tournament to meet, to watch him play. We had Barcelona fly out to that tournament. 
not just to watch the tournament, to watch Dylan Tombides. Because at the time his contract wasn't quite signed at West Ham. It was being renegotiated from his original contract. And there was a lot of interest, but he had no interest in leaving. Tombides away, he could be in. Danger signs are there. I remember him ringing me the day before the, the tournament all started. And he said, Mum, just so you know, I've written happy birthday mum on my shin pad, so when I score, I'm going to pull it out and wish you a happy birthday. And I just said, thank you so much, I can't wait to see that, you know. Um, I, in the back of my mind, I'm going, oh, don't jinx yourself, but like Dylan, Dylan was confident. He knew that he was gonna score in that game and he knew that he was going to, um, yeah, wish me a happy birthday. Might be a chance for Tom Reeves, but he's got the winner. That is the moment to strike. Tom Bides with a goal that could prove so vital. I was sitting on the couch and I had this delayed streaming of the game by about probably three minutes. And so when Dylan scored, my Facebook just lit up, my messages, my phone lit up. And I, so I just knew to sit there and watch the next three minutes intently because, yeah, it was, it was the you know, the preamble to just this most amazing, iconic moment for, for him and for, for me. And that's what it means. Happy birthday, Mum. What a way to celebrate. That was a fantastic event for him. He played very well. And, and a lot of things happened from there. And the man on the books of West Ham United finishes. What an important moment for Dylan Tombides. I was in Cancun at the time, just after the World Cup. I had a voicemail and I thought, I need to hear this one. The Australian doctors rang me up saying, you know, you need to give me a call ASAP. I was aware that Dylan had a random drug test. He'd been pulled along with one of the other boys. And so Dylan phoned him. He got told that he had um, failed a drug test. He's told me I've either taken something illegal or I have a tumour. And at the time, obviously, young, not exactly taught these sort of things in school. I didn't, I didn't think so much of it, and it's just, it never really occurred to me how, how serious the case was. I spoke to the doc, and the doc said, look, he's been with us for over a month. The only way his levels are raised if he's taken a performance-enhancing drug or he has potentially a tumour. And he said, Jim, we know that he's been with us. We know what he's eaten and drunk the whole time. Jim phoned me. He was obviously distraught. After composing myself, I went into mum mode. And um, my first call was to Doc Wheeler from West Ham to turn around and say, Dylan's just been um, just failed a drug test, and this is the information that I have. Uh, he's due home Thursday. Um, please, can you help me arrange the necessary screening and process that he has to go through? He landed Thursday night, Friday. He went in the morning, went down to the doctors, had a scan, identified that he had um, testicular cancer. So the next step was obviously to remove the testicles. And yeah, I was heartbroken and was devastated. But, you know, uh, you've got to think positive and you've got to think, OK, let's get it out and recover and, and all will be good. I didn't understand the severity of it at the time and I don't think Unless you're going through it, you really can understand the severity of it. He was so positive. He just sort of went, yeah, let's do it. It's got to be done, it's got to be done. He did say to me, can I die from this? And I said, well, we've got it early. So the prognosis for testicular cancer is normally quite good. The stats say sort of 90, 95% of testicular cancer patients survive. You know, you just, you're numb. You think, 
where have we just landed? You know, it's totally, totally on a high down to the lowest low. West Ham turned around and said to us, you know, through Doc Wheeler and Karen Brady, that whatever Dylan needs, whatever the family needs, I only have to ask. I can either go through Doc or I can go directly to Karen. Whatever, whatever we need, we just need to ask. Oh, look, it was an extremely difficult time for Dylan and his family. And for me at the club, I'd never experienced anything like it before. Uh, it created a really strong bond between Tracy and I, because obviously I have a son and I could not imagine what she was going through. I'm so grateful that Karen Brady was at West Ham when um, Dylan and the family needed someone the most. But his attitude was just amazing. Just, OK, let's do it, let's get it out, and then we get back to training. I remember being out on the pitch there and Dylan come in to spend some time with his friends, really, after treatment. And he, he, he was like, he just still had a smile on his face. And he, I remember him walking across the pitch and kicking the ball and just seeing, like, just giving the, the boys inspiration, if you know what I mean, like, to go, like, we know how much this boy's been through and he's still smiling and kicking the ball around on a pitch. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a credit to him, for sure. He did start regimes of chemo. Um, they knocked him back, obviously. And so he'd get himself fit, play, score a few goals, um, and then he'd end up back in hospital having chemo. Um, the doctors were amazed because the chemo is so strong, and they were surprised that he could go back to football so quickly sometimes. We put that down to Dylan's attitude. Eight months into the treatment where, you know, I'm still fighting it and I was thinking, oh, after first treatment, I'm going to be playing again in four months' time, you know, this is, this is just a little illness. He wanted to put on his kit, he wanted to play the sport that he loved and he wanted to do what he loved. And he had, of course, so many knockbacks uh, with his illness. Did actually go into his liver, so he had part of his liver removed. So that was tough, because he just wanted to play football. He never, ever, ever gave up on his dream of playing for West Ham. And of course, in September 2012, that dream came true and he made his debut at Upton Park. I remember going to the game with his physio, John Irvin. He had two tickets because uh, Jim and Taylor were in Iran. Taylor was playing with the under-17s in Iran. I remember sitting up there and watching Dylan warm up and I'm confident that he's going to play because he was told he was going to play. I think I started the game and I don't think I was on the pitch when he come on. I think I'd, I'd come off at the time. I remember actually getting pretty emotional sitting there watching him come on. It was a credit to Dylan that he was ill and he pulled on the shirt and he played. We wanted him to have that experience. We wanted him to know that that was his future. He just got this most amazing reception and um, it was, it was goosebump-like. Um, I remember sitting in front of a mum and a young boy, and the young boy turned around and said, Mum, why does he have no hair? And his mum went, I don't know why he doesn't have any hair. So I turned around and I said, oh, it's the medication that he's on. It was just this moment of realisation of, wow, mate, look what you've done. You've, you know, you're on chemotherapy drugs and you're playing first team football. 
you always wanted to make it on the world stage and this it was just I was in tears I was just so happy for him I remember speaking to him afterwards when I got back to London I said, I said you've done it you've you've made your debut I said fantastic I said you know what you're going through you should be proud of that he goes oh yeah I am but I just want to I just want to get out there again I said, it'll happen don't worry about it Dylan made it really easy um, for his friends and for his family and especially me by getting up every morning and functioning. Um, you know, he had every reason to curl up and stay in bed, but he didn't. continued treatment uh, on and off playing treatment on and off this went for nearly three years it did then get to the stage where the English doctors were starting to run out of ideas I remember such a sense of frustration that there wasn't more that could be done despite everyone's best efforts and it was a really really emotional uh, and frustrating time for everybody and just this desire from everyone for him to be well, to be back to his best. He said to me once, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. He said to me, I'm sorry. Said, sorry for what? I'm sorry it's come back. I said, um, don't be stupid. You know, and he's more worrying about me coming to the hospital at one o'clock at that time. I, it was about one o'clock in the morning. Like that matters. And he's apologising to me. <laughs> he was a one off. He very rarely showed his vulnerability, he very rarely showed that he was struggling. It wasn't until, you know, one time he, he it hits me like a, a ton of bricks actually, he, he went down to training a bit more sluggishly than, you know, normal. He was just a little bit, you know, I'm going in, um, he, he came back like 15, 20 minutes later and I said, oh, is everything alright mate? He said, I just, I can't do it today. I said, no worries, go rest. He was grey. He was ashen like I've never, never seen him before, and it was, um, it was really hard to watch. Um, but still, at that point, I did not even dawn on me that that my son would lose his his battle for life. It just didn't didn't twig. Um, so yeah, that was probably the one of the you know I didn't have too many times where I went, oh, he's not winning this fight. That was that was one of them. for a Perth-born soccer player who's died of testicular cancer at age 20. Tom Beattie's was diagnosed with testicular cancer at just 17 years old and battled the disease for three years. He was seen as a rising star it was a Good Friday when we were told that he had passed. Um, and I was at home. It was just so incredibly sad. Sorry. The following day, Easter Saturday, was a West Ham match against Crystal Palace. West Ham contacted me and asked if we would consider coming to the, the game on the Saturday. And we, we said yes, because we just needed 
to do something. We needed some structure. We needed to, um, yeah, to do it. So, um, so we went to, we went to the game, and we were told that they wanted to retire Dylan's shirt, that they wanted Jim and Taylor to place his shirt in the centre circle, and did they think that they would be up to doing that? And we were just all numb, and it was like, just tell us what you want us to do, and we'll do it. Now ahead of kickoff, West Ham are paying tribute to their 20-year-old striker, Dylan Tomvides, who tragically passed away yesterday after three years fighting testicular cancer. The Australian was a hugely popular figure here and even made his first team debut while undergoing treatment. Coming onto the pitch with a West Ham shirt bearing Dylan's name and number, his dad, Jim, and younger brother Taylor, who's also on the books here at West Ham. A desperately sad day for everyone involved with the club. I remember being so proud of our supporters when Jim and Taylor walked out the 38 shirt onto the centre circle and the whole crowd was showing their appreciation for this wonderful young man. Well, a very moving tribute, and we're told that West Ham will retire the number 38 in honour of Dylan. The one thing that springs to my mind, you know, I remember Millet taking the penalty and then racing over to the away fans, just trying to calm them down because it was like it was just his way of going, guys, it's just not that important. On a day like today, it's just not that important. I think. You know, from me being an Australian and, and sort of hearing about the news and what the significance of the game was going to be, I just remember the celebrations were obviously muted because I knew the significance of what the occasion was going to be. And then I think from that point on and, and after the game, I just remember thinking to myself, oh, I need to go and send my condolences and my support to Dylan's family. I got the opportunity afterwards to meet him and, and you know, talk to him. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't long after until, you know, um, we developed a friendship and, and we got brought into the family and it was really comforting to, you know, have the opportunity to spend Christmas and watch their kids grow up and, yeah, it was, it was a really thoughtful thing for them to do. It was great to get you know, to have Taylor and um, Jim and Tracy all sat in our house and, you know, spending some time with them, then getting to sort of meet my, my kids at the time and sort of build on relationships with them. And it was always something that we um, were very conscious of and something that we, you know, we valued um, ultimately. Karen Brady would write to me not only as Dylan was going through his treatment, but afterwards as well. Dear, Dear Tracy, Tracy, as, as Vice, Vice Chairman of West Ham United, United Football Club, Club, I'm very proud that Dylan wore our famous claret and blue. Dylan was a very special young man who had a profound effect on those around him at the club. His fortitude in the face of illness that ultimately took his life was amazing. Dylan was loved and respected throughout the football community for his talent, his smile and his spirit. Dylan was already a star, we all knew it. What he achieved in his 20 years was astonishing, but we also knew he had the potential to go on and accomplish even greater things. Though Dylan sadly left us, his legacy will always live on at West Ham and far beyond. At West Ham, we take great pride in taking care of our own. Dylan and his family will always be a part of the West Ham family. Dylan's number 38 shirt, now formally retired by the club, will stand as a mark of respect to a young man with so much to give. We thought the world of Dylan, and we know how much he loved West Ham United. West, West Ham, Ham United, United Vice, Vice Chairman, Chairman Karen, Karen Brady. Brady. I'd like to show you Dylan's resting place. Very personal and not too many people know that, but people are curious living up here where I actually have him. And I never really knew what I wanted to do with him. I didn't know. And Dylan brought himself a bottle of Ace of Spades champagne for his 21st birthday, which he never got to, to drink. And so in the end, like Taylor 
celebrated and it was then where we just went you know he's had such a champagne lifestyle why don't we put Dylan in in um, a bottle of Ace of Spades champagne so um, yeah we did we put him in a bottle of Jeroboam bottle of um, Ace of Spades so this is where my boy my boys rests And um, what position on the pitch do you have? What? what what's your position? Um, back. Right back. Right back, is it? I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. You know, Dylan's passing had a profound effect on the family. You know, Taylor went through, uh, he struggled straight after. It was a big part of their lives that had just gone missing, you know. Both Taylor and Jim were best friends with Dylan and now their best friend had gone. The one thing I, I know is that all three of us grieved differently, you know, all of us and I, my focus became on Taylor. Taylor dealt with it in his way. We tried to pull together and stay together as a family unit. It was tough with Taylor then losing his career through injury. Taylor was deeply affected. We wanted him to feel as supported as it was possible that he could feel under such dreadful circumstances. <laughs> I needed to get Caleb thinking more positively and get him wanting to carry on with his own life and get him onto focusing on, on what he wanted to. Losing my brother was something that I couldn't accept. Mentally, I was, I just didn't see a point in life anymore. Went to America when I was 20 with West Ham as a coach and the family that was looking after me took me out shooting. Um, so they had, they had a few guns, we went to a field. Uh, they had a pistol, they walked off to go put uh, some bait out for some deer. I took the pistol to my head and pulled the trigger and missed. So yeah, it was some really, really dark times for me. They, they never, they never got shared to anyone. That was, that was me, myself, and I. And here is a big goal-scoring chance, and he has put it away. Taylor Tombides. That is a beautiful moment a beautiful moment this is the brother of Dylan Tombides the young Australian Academy boy here who was so sadly taken from us too early by testicular cancer going through my brother's death I think was the tipping point for my football career and I just never ever got to fully recover from that side of the game you can see he's never moved a goal before <laughs> Come on, never had the luxury of uh, having such, so bring it back a little, uh, push yours forward. Yeah. Yeah. Such elaborate goals. Yeah, now we go. Calgary Football Soccer Club is where I work now. Coming over to Calgary where no one really knows me, no one knows my, my name, my legacy, and my brother's name obviously gives me a, a clean path to kind of make my own life and make my own stamp in the game of football as a, as a coach now and create my own legacy.
Look, I'm, I'm so proud of, of Taylor, obviously knowing how dark a spot he was in and how he wanted to be with his brother, not here. So to come out of there to watch him manage, watch him transition from a professional footballer to a professional coach and see that growth in him. Yeah, he's doing really, really well and he's really happy and, you know, that's all, all I can want is for him to, to be happy. They were both amazing parents. They did everything for me and Dylan as players. They did everything for myself after Dylan died. So yeah, not, nothing other than thank you very much for everything you did for me. Smells nice, doesn't it? If the day's like this tomorrow, the sun's shining, I'll be very happy. But I must warn you, I'm not expecting it because Dylan has a really wicked sense of humour and he will have it raining at some point during the day just to let everyone know that he's around. It may be 10 years, but it still feels for everybody like it was yesterday. And we still mourn his loss and we still want to celebrate him and we still want to spread the, the great work that Tracy's doing. I'm not doing any work whatsoever for this day, you know. I've got all my, all my help. Because I flew Chris in from... Chris is one of my directors from Australia. <laughs> so he's flown over. Turn him around, guys. Names on the back, yeah. Please. Yeah, makes sense. Taylor, Taylor's wearing 39, Dylan 38, yeah. Her strength is such an inspiration. She's a hero. She has turned this raw grief into a one woman crusade to educate people through Dylan's story. So he's never forgotten. I'm all here, right? Bit larry, yeah? Hi, Trace, how are you doing? I'm good, darling. How are you? I feel that my purpose is to continue that message and to raise awareness of, of men's health through Dylan's passing. She wants to save every family from the pain her family have been through. And she's doing that through her great work through the DT38. Hi, I'm Tracy. Hey, right. Oh, well, yeah. lovely to meet you. Thank you very much for your involvement Thank you for having me involved. No, and all the, you know, obviously all the social medias and stuff. <laughs> no, well, well, hopefully you're still laughing like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the idea. That walking well. That's the idea. I'll be all right. I'll yeah. be all right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. When I know that um, people come up to me and they say, thank you for all you do with the charity because the message has saved my son's life because of your Dylan story. I was able to catch this early. I know that I'm, I'm doing the right thing in his memory. Thank you so much for giving up your time and, and being here today. It, it means a lot to us as a family. I've got a lot of ambassadors here and very grateful for your time. I'm very fortunate to be able to obviously be in the male change room of a football uh, team, so I'm not shy of that um, opportunity, but um, it gives me the opportunity also to, to show you my own set of testicles, which I carry with me always. And the importance of these is we take these into the schools and into the workshops, and we've just recently done one with, with Kenny and the, the uh, academy players, um, and they actually have tumours in them. So we get to teach the kids what it feels like to, um, to have a tumour, to have a, a lump in your testicle. And I don't know if there's anyone that wants to volunteer for a live demonstration. I don't know. I heard that, Jimmy, that was part of the captain's role. Yep. Yeah. 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 Here, drop it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to chicken out. I'm not going to... The air comes on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> would you like to fill my testicles? <laughs> I knew there was something, Chase. <laughs> OK, so this is, this is basically what we do. We, we try and get the kids and we pass these testicles around to find four lumps in them. Ooh. They've got their four tumours. And this is what Dylan had when he was, you know, when he first found a lump. And he went to the doctors and he had a tumour. So this is why we like to just 
educate people around the really the importance of early detection. And I enjoy these sort of opportunities because um, recently we had a an event with Palo de Canio at Adam Brentwood. And there was eight mates that sat there and said, oh, come on, let's all go get off and get tested. And they all went and got tested and one of them was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Oh. So, you know, knowing that we've potentially saved another person's life is, is a huge thing. So thanks for your time. Have a wonderful day. And if anyone else wants to check out my balls, just come and ask, okay? <laughs> really good. Thank yeah, you, well, my balls back for me. That was longer. That was longer than a minute. <laughs> I'm so grateful that we are able to have the awareness matches, to be able to have people acknowledge your son, acknowledge what his memory means to the club is, is just fantastic. But, but more importantly for me, I know that those people in the crowd that don't know what it's all about will go home and find out. And, you know, it means that the charity um, has been able to reach another, another section of people, another big group of, of fans, and that his passing won't be in vain. most important thing about this documentary is that people remember that name, Dylan Sobeides. Dylan's never forgotten. Not Dylan the footballer. Dylan the person. It's amazing, that, you know, the fact that he passed at 20 years old and here I am at 64 now and when I pass, there's not going to be statues and, and stones. and So what he did in such a short time, and he will be remembered for the rest, rest of the days. The statue outside the Perth Glory Stadium is, oh, considering he, nev he never played for them and barely spent any time in Australia, is, a, is an achievement and an accomplishment that shows what kind of person he was, what kind of potential he had as a footballer. My name's John Tomidis, nicknamed Dill, position striker. I think about this all the time. Where would he have been? I would have put my ass on him playing Champions League football. That is the saddest parts of this. The loss of such a great talent and this great young man who would have gone on, I absolutely believe it, to be uh, held in the same esteem as Bobby Moore, he would have been exceptional. He would have been great for Australian football. He would have been great for West Ham. 
I think the destination for me would have been solely on Dylan's shoulders. I mean, unfortunately, we'll never know. I have no doubt that he would have gone on to be that 1% of players that make it in the Premier League. The, oh, the feelings is the feelings are proud, amazed, and gobsmacked of what he was able to accomplish. The way he was going, I'd have to say he would have certainly been playing top-level Premier League, 100%. But you know, at the same time, you can't. I'm as proud as a mum can be. I communicate with him on a regular basis. I know that he's proud of what we've achieved down here. I know that he is also overwhelmed by the legacy that has been left behind for him. Um, you know, he never, you know, he didn't think that um, he would have such an impact on the world, and he has.